thank you very much for being with us today we have uh, our main speaker dr ann hilty she is a psychologist she is an expert in research cultural worldwide and a writer and today she will talk about intercultural competency which is a very important topic for us in bpw international she has been a member in bpw since 2011 she attended many, uh, since then the international congresses and she founded bpw hong kong in 2015 before that she belongs to BPW USA in New York and the Virtual Club. And uh, uh, actually, she is stay also in BPW Hong Kong as a member, but it was invited for um, BPW Thessaloniki, Greece in last year. So as you can see, she really uh, is part of BPW around the world. And uh, always in her travels, in her constant travels, she tried to meet our BPW members. And uh, it's a pleasure for us today to having you. Thank you, and the floor is yours. Hello, everyone, and thanks for joining me in this webinar on intercultural competency, something that I'm particularly passionate about, or as I like to call it, skills for the 21st century. So what is global competence, first of all? Let's look at the OECD definition of that, which is the capacity to analyze global and intercultural issues critically and from multiple perspectives, to understand how differences affect perceptions, judgments, and ideas of self and others, and to engage in open, appropriate, and effective interactions with others from different backgrounds on the basis of a shared respect for human dignity. That works for me. But what is intercultural competence? Well, Deerdorf, who is female, by the way, and one of the scholars in cultural studies has defined it this way. The ability to develop targeted knowledge, skills, and attitudes which lead to visible behavior and communication that are both effective, again, effective, and appropriate in intercultural interactions. So that's what we're about today in this seminar. But what is culture? Well, the most common model for culture is iceberg, the iceberg, because 90% of an iceberg is beneath the surface of the water. What we usually think of as culture is what's above the water in this diagram, what's visible or what's in our conscious awareness. And that is the behavior of people from a certain group, usually related to ethnicity, and the artifacts that they've produced throughout time. But what's below the surface are the norms, the social norms, the beliefs, the assumptions of what's right and wrong, the right way to do things and such the values, deepest of all. This is invisible to the eye, not only of the person outside of that culture, but also to the members of that culture. It's out of conscious awareness, and that's the vast majority of what culture actually is. We have a saying in cultural studies, if you want to know about the water, don't ask the fish. Because the people inside a culture, we should ask them many questions in reality, but the people who within their own culture know it very deeply and very uh, much a part of who they are, but they can't often verbalize it because it's not the sort of thing we usually analyze. So what is culture? Well, here are two definitions. The first one on the left is pretty standard. It's the way I think many of us may think of culture. The sum of a way of life, the total of a way of life, including expected behavior, beliefs, values, language, and living practices shared by members of a society. Pretty basic, right? Hofstede, on the right-hand side, who is also one of the foremost thinkers in cultural studies, defined it more simply as a programming of the mind. A certain way of thinking, living, and looking at things. That actually is learned, not 
natural to us. So let's look further. Looks more like this. At the bottom of this pyramid, we have human nature. And so if we say, aren't all human beings the same? We're all human after all. To some degree, that's true. That's inherited, it's biological, it's also based on having grown up in human societies. And so that aspect of the whole is universal. At the top is our individual personality. It's very specific. It's both inherited and learned, nature and nurture. But in the middle, and rather large, is culture. And culture also navigates or negotiates between basic human nature and our individual personality. It's a kind of filter if you will. It's specific to a group or a category of people and it's learned. It's purely learned, not inherited. And there are lots of variations, not just from one culture to the next, but also within them. First of all, though, there are some universal themes. And if you want to know more about a culture or cultures, these are the questions you want to ask yourself. What are the methods for cooking and the types of food that they tend to eat? What about dancing? That particularly makes me happy, but that's cultural universal. What are their attitudes toward family? How important is the family unit? What does the family unit look like? What are the celebrations, the methods of greetings? How do they have rituals for burial? What's around gift giving? And we might add hospitality and so on. These are specific features that are found in one form or another with wide variation but the, they are generally found in each culture. And then there are also variations within those features, individual traits in each culture, of course, but also subcultures. So if you look at the North, the Middle, or the South of any given country, you're going to find a lot of differences culturally. And everyone knows that about their own country. So there are lots and lots of subcultures. And then there are countercultures, groups who live together within another culture, but they live differently and sometimes opposite to that culture. So there are uncountable variations on this cultural theme. There are also a lot of misconceptions or things that are generally believed, but in fact are not true. And the first is that culture is homogenous. All Chinese, all Italians, all Brazilians, wrong, wrong, wrong. It's not the same for every member of that culture. Culture is also not a thing. It's not something we can touch or quantify. It's much broader and more complex than that. It's also not uniformly distributed among members of a group. Some may be closer to their traditions than others. Some may be more typical of their culture than others. There's a range of it. It's also not true that an individual possesses only one culture. So far, I've been mentioning ethnic or national groups, but one person actually has a number of cultural contributors within them. Also not true is that culture is custom or behavior. That's usually how we think about it. That's the 10% above the waterline in our iceberg image, but it's certainly not limited to that. And finally, the, another myth is that culture is timeless. But if you think of any particular culture in centuries past and today, probably a lot of their culture features have changed in that time. So what are some aspects of culture that we can actually hold on to? Well, one is traits, the individual features of a culture, and that's regarding actions and behaviors and such that are in a particular situation or based on a particular need. So Arabic culture, which is in typically desert climates, will be very different from tropical cultures, which again will be very different from mountainous cultures, just to look at geography. Then we have complexes, which are clusters of these individual cultural traits. And that's what allows us to say Chinese people have these kinds of traits. Of course, it's not always true. We have to be careful about that. And that brings me to my next point. We can then bunch complexes together. So traits together become complexes and then complexes together become patterns. And we can see these patterns. We can say people in this particular area or of this particular group have these certain things that we call their culture, certain customs, certain beliefs, certain values. We have to be careful because patterns can flip into stereotypes. And that's when we start thinking that all members of the culture share those same traits. It's never 100% true. 
we must also caution ourselves about two other things. And one is being too narrow and the other too broad, so to speak. Ethnocentrism is a big word meaning our own ethnicity or our own culture is the center of our universe. Now, naturally it is when we grow up as kids. But when we want to become culturally competent, we have to continually learn how to think outside of our own culture and not use that as our main reference point. And naturally it is our main reference point. So we're going against our nature a little bit by doing that. It's a tendency to view your group as superior. A lot of that's unconscious when we say, why do they do this this way? It's illogical or it's not convenient or whatever. Well, they do it that way because it works for them. So it's not illogical and it's not inconvenient for them. But that brings us to the other caution, which is cultural relativism. All things in all cultures are equally good and of equal value. And that's also not true. We would probably agree that slavery is not a good thing, regardless of what culture we come from. And yet throughout history, maybe every culture, certainly most have had slaves at one time or another. And many do today in one form or another. But when we talk about basic humanity and human rights, then we can generally agree that's not a good trait for a culture to have. Foot binding in China for centuries was considered by women and men alike to be a sign of beauty. And today the Chinese as well agree that that was a form of crippling. So not everything about a culture is of equal value, let's just say. So what are these competencies that we talk about then? Well, they're in three categories, and those were mentioned early in my presentation when I quoted Deerdorf about what is culture and what is cultural competency. And it's skills, knowledge and understanding, and attitudes. And a lot of this is very transferable, transferable skills, transferable attitudes, which means they're general and they apply to many aspects of our lives, professional and personal. So the skills that we need our abilities of analytical and critical thinking, to think deeply. That might seem basic, but any educator will tell you that it's sorely lacking in today's societies. So the ability and in fact willingness to think deeply and to analyze things. If you want to be culturally competent, you have to analyze everything around you. Secondly is the ability to interact respectfully, appropriately and effectively. Again, not as common a trait as we would like. But if you want to know about other cultures and you will not appreciate or agree with everything about that culture, but you must come to it with an air of respect. Empathy goes a long way toward trying to put yourself in the cultural shoes of another person to see things through their eyes. That's the definition of empathy, really. And flexibility. You will often be wrong, you will often be challenged, and you will often have to second guess yourself. And you will often be uncertain. And so you have to be very, very flexible. And when it comes to knowledge and understanding, well, the first and the second here are pretty self-explanatory, but they're huge bodies of work. So the first is knowledge and understanding of global issues. Read the news around the world every day, not just your local issues. Uh, know about local global politics, know about global events, know about global treaties, know about histories and shared histories and borders and points of contention. So this is a lifelong project. And the second one as well is lifelong learning, intercultural knowledge and understanding. I've been in about 110 countries for cultural research at this point. I'm about to go into many more in the next few months. And this is an ongoing, maybe lifetime project for me. Do I know, can I know about all cultures? Absolutely not possible. I can learn cross-cultural skills and I can learn something about each culture and sometimes deeply, but this is an ongoing process. Finally, attitudes an openness toward people from other cultures. That may sound really basic to you because you've come to this video and this topic. But for a lot of people, they're not actually that curious and they are comfortable staying in what's familiar and what's similar to them. That in fact is our core comfort zone. So an openness toward people who are different from ourselves 
is actually an attitude that we can cultivate. Respect for cultural differences. Again, not all differences at the same level of value, and sometimes they may violate general human rights as are agreed upon by all of us. But generally, to have that attitude of respect is essential. Global-mindedness, of course, thinking outside of your own little box. And finally, responsibility. I'm often reading the world news and I'm reading about some disaster or some critical issue or some hot topic in a, a part of the world where I have been and I know people and I've done some studying and I know about their culture to some level or another. And I am always saying, you can't close your eyes anymore to the world. The more you know, the less you can close your eyes and turn away. So responsibility comes hand in hand with this. This is one of the ways that we looked at different cultures early on. This is a model from the 1990s. And yes, there are models in which it helps us to understand cultures, where they fall on graphs is a good way of comparing cultures and getting a greater understanding. This one isn't used as much today, but you can see different aspects of the world. And interestingly, Europe that's Catholic and Europe that's Protestant tends to fall into two different areas slightly. So some of these are geographically regional, actually many of them are, but some of them are based also on other commonalities. And there are two points on the scale here. On the left-hand side going up is traditional versus secular, rational, or more science-based values. And on the bottom scheme is survival versus self-expression. Certainly you can have both and a lot of cultures are in the middle. Some are more on the basic survival or simple living and some are very high on self-expression. And that often goes hand in hand with societies that value individualism, which is another way of looking at that. We're not going to look at specifics here because this is in fact one of the early models. The Lewis model is widely used today. There is a more detailed version of this with more countries listed, but this is the general or basic version that's often portrayed. And there are three main points at each of the three intersections on the triangle. A linear, active, multi-active, or reactive, sometimes also called passive. Uh, passive can sometimes have negative connotations, so usually reactive is what this is called. So according to where a culture falls on these continuums, they're more likely to be active or direct or take an active part in anything. And if they're more on the reactive side, they're more likely to respond to a given situation to respond in whatever way is appropriate based on what's happening. And societies that are more fatalistic, accepting life as it comes, would tend to be closer to that mark. At the top, we have multi-active. Multi-active is similar to um, multifunctioning or multitasking. And so these are um, peoples who appreciate functioning on several levels at a time. Things happening at uh, the more or less the same time, less of a concern with the construct of time, and also tending more to focus on relationship and emotions. Bottom left, we have linear active, which is more our British and German and Austrian and uh, a lot of Western Europe actually, and the US and so on, Canada and such. And these are more your planners, your organizers, the ones who like all the dots in a row. So these are very simplistic ways of interpreting this. There's much more detailed interpretation. But we can see also how different countries and cultures relate to one another on this scale. Even if they're in the same part of the world, they may not be at the same place on this uh, diagram. Another way of looking at the Lewis model can be this, this form here. And it's exactly the same model as the previous one. Countries fall into more on the active sides of the model or more on the passive side or reactive and more multi-active or linear one by one active. And active task oriented is more linear schedules and organization. And more active people oriented is still very direct, but more about the relationship and less concerned with schedules and time. And then you have the reactive or passive categories on the bottom. One is more people oriented again, and one is more task oriented. And so countries can be plotted on this kind of disc, as well as the previous triangle. It's essentially the same way of looking at cultures. 
we also have a number of variables that are looked at. And one of those is high and low context. A culture, especially in the way it communicates, will depend on either context, the surrounding circumstances, or not so much. If you're a low context culture, such as uh, most English speaking cultures actually, and German and a lot of others, that means the words are the words. The words don't really change too much. We don't rely on in what context we're saying them. We're very dependent on the verbal aspect and it's the nonverbal always supports the verbal. So body language and what we're saying should match. High context, the meaning can change quite a lot depending on the surrounding circumstances, who you're with, who you are, are you senior or junior, the history behind the situation and many other things. So there's a lot of meta messages, a lot that you have to read between the lines. You need to be very observant of that context and that's a great source for misunderstanding. If even if you're a high context society but you don't come from a particular society or culture, that can be more difficult to understand. Communication styles. You've probably heard about some of this, at least the first one, direct versus indirect. So let me give you an example of that. I come from one of the more direct societies, which is US, that's my background. And from there, I'm from New York City, which is more direct even than most of America. And then I moved myself to South Korea 15 years ago by choice and for cultural reasons. And I won't go into all of that. But one of those was they're an extremely indirect society. They're also an extremely monocultural society and New York is one of the most diverse places in the world and so on. So contrast was one of the things I was looking for. So in an indirect society, I would say something very directly, five or 10 words. And then I used to like to joke about this, 20 minutes later, my Korean interpreter is still talking for my five or 10 words because they must create the context. They must say a lot of other things that are about establishing relationship and a lot of other things before they get to the point. So direct versus indirect can be a source of communication challenges, let's say. Elaborate versus succinct. Well, I just came from, I'm in Thailand as I speak to you today, but I just came from three months in Italy, which I adore. And boy, are they an elaborate culture. Lots and lots and lots and lots of words as well as body language, <laughs> which is why I'm doing that. And so it's a very elaborate communication style and very succinct might be Finland or Netherlands or lots of northern climates generally tend to be very brief and concise with their words. And every word has very specific meanings. So you know exactly what they mean, but they're not talking a lot. And an elaborate culture is painting a picture for you. It's much more visual. So very different communication styles again and cultures tend to fall into one or the other of those. Person-centered versus context-centered. This is also an individualistic society versus a group-oriented society. And that will determine how you communicate quite a lot. And you can imagine that. And then instrumental versus effective. Is it more about the relationship and the emotions that you're trying to convey? Or is it more about conveying the information itself and getting from point A to point B? So these are different communication styles based on your culture. Politeness can mean many, many things. So politeness in Eastern societies, where I've lived more or less for the last 15 years, is a lot about, we say face and saving face, but it's also a lot about not showing your emotions on your face, because that's what a child does. If you think of a two or three year old throwing a tantrum completely out of control of his or her emotions, we think of that as childish behavior. And in the Eastern parts of Asia, particularly, they think that showing emotions on your face as you're communicating are also childish, that you should control yourself just as you do in your behavior. And yet in my own cultural background in the US, for example, and most of Europe, we have some problem with that because we think we should show meaning on our face and it helps us to communicate that a lot of our communication is actually nonverbal. And some of that might be body language and other cues, but a lot of that is facial expression. So that can be quite different, what's polite and what isn't. Politeness can also be used to include or to exclude, to create distance, to remain vague and not specific to your situation, or to 
use humor and small talk and to encourage and compliment people. So politeness and manners can differ quite a lot in why they're being used from one culture to another. Nonverbal communication, we know that this is very cultural. Again, I was just in Italy for three months and saw many people talking on their mobile phone, usually it was even Bluetooth, and wildly gesticulating with their hand. Of course, the person they're talking to doesn't see a thing. They're on the train in the middle of a crowd or somewhere like that. But their way of speaking includes a lot of nonverbal and that doesn't just shut off because the other person can't see it. Nonverbal can mean very different things. Eye contact in one culture might mean that you are trustworthy and that you are also trusting of the other person. In another culture, it can mean intimacy and give a signal you may or may not want to give. In yet another culture, it can be challenging and aggressive. So lots of our nonverbal communication differs greatly from one to the other. What I've just been describing is actually kinesics, the third column here about body language and facial gestures and eye contact. Just above that in the middle, we have proxemics, which has to do with distance between people. Is it okay to touch if you don't know each other very well? Is laying your hand on their arm as you're talking to them acceptable or not? Uh, how much space do you need between bodies as you're standing? You might dance across the room if one wants a lot of space and the other one doesn't want as much based on culture. Time at the top of this. Time is very differently perceived in different parts of the world and you must all know that at least to some degree. Punctuality is important to some cultures and flexibility important to others. Relationship first, let's sit and have a coffee and get to know each other versus let's please stay on schedule as a matter of respecting one another. Very different objectives. Um, I'm coming to see you at four o'clock today it could mean at four or five of, or it could mean somewhere around four-ish, or it could mean sometime today or tomorrow. So the way we perceive time is very different. So finally, we have contextual, contextual cues, looking at the context, especially in a high context environment. Oral cues, intonation and pitch are very different meanings in different places. When uh, people come to China who are not Chinese, they often say, why are they always fighting? Because it's a very animated language with a lot of tones and a lot of volume. <laughs> but it has nothing to do with fighting most of the time. And so in Chinese language, though, the different tones make for different words. In another language, like their next door neighbor in Korea, intonation is not part of their language. So these can be very different even within the same subregion. Perceiving is not only what, but also how. So not just finding out the information, but finding out how things are done and how beliefs and values are um, manifested in a given culture. And when the meaning is even slightly uncertain, we should ask. Ask the person you're talking to. Ask them if uh, your meaning was understood as well. So interculturally competent communication, which is just one aspect of intercultural competency, but a very important one, and what we've been talking about for the last five minutes, first relies on that basic knowledge of cultural norms, history and conflict and so on. Can we do that for every culture? For sure we cannot, but we can get some knowledge of many cultures. And if we're going to one for a conference, for example, we can learn more about that home culture. So we can continually add to our knowledge. Sensitivity and empathy, put yourself in the other person's shoes. Try to see through their cultural eyes, as I often say. The willingness to be wrong, oh, that's big. If you're uncomfortable with being wrong, that's going to be a problem. You often will be wrong. You often will be uncertain. You often will not know what's going on around you if you're with people of another culture. And you have to be increasingly comfortable with that. And flexibility and adaptability for the same reason. You need to be able to adapt to different cultural ways and styles and beliefs and ways of thinking and communicating. And we can become more and more and more adaptable. Believe me, living abroad in any other country will definitely increase your flexibility and adaptability. And awareness of ethnocentrism, seeing things from our own cultural perspective, 
and of course stereotypes, thinking that all people of a group have certain traits always in common and to the same degree. So this is being aware of that, of course. These are some of the keys to interculturally competent communication. This is why this is so complicated. So we have, just as an example here, some of the things we were talking about. In the first line for communication, high and low context. Does it depend on the context or just on the words? In the middle, we have things like task-based versus relationship-based, which is more important, which is given priority. I mentioned that. We also have things toward the bottom about linear time and flexible time. I mentioned that. These are just three examples. There are many more there. And we have two countries, both in Western Europe, Germany and France. We could assume they have some things in common. And two from Northeastern Asia, China and Japan, we might also assume some traits in common. And indeed, those two sets fall on somewhat on the same sides of this chart, but there's a lot of weaving back and forth. And so you can see how this can be plotted, but also how difficult it can be to really understand people from of cultures other than our own. What are some of those primary challenges? So first is ambiguity nothing ever seeming really clear or really certain. Needing to be flexible and adaptable and willing to be wrong and willing to be unsure because ambiguity is the name of the game when we cross cultures. It's also uncomfortable psychologically for most of us, maybe all of us. Interference, many, many things will interfere. The basic cultural differences, of course, and communication language itself, but lots of other things, so, for example, different nonverbal cues will also provide interference. So there are a lot of things that will interfere with cultural understanding, cross-cultural understanding. A lack of equivalence. You may be looking at or become aware of a cultural trait in a culture other than your own that has simply nothing like it in your own culture. You have nothing to compare it to, nothing to help you understand it. Prejudice. None of us are without prejudice. At its core, prejudice just means a preconceived idea. And if I said to you right now, what do you think about Chinese culture, about Australian culture, about Brazilian culture, about Canadian culture, about Finnish culture? You would have something to say about each of those. Might be right, might not, might be partly true. We all have preconceived ideas about other cultures. And that can be a challenge, an interference, particularly if it's not true. Stereotypes. Stereotype at its core means 100%. So anytime we are looking at things that are traits of a culture, but we begin to think it's 100% true or true for all members of that culture, we've ventured into the realm of stereotype. 100% is never true, I like to say. A lack of knowledge of body language and nonverbal cues. I mentioned a few of those, for example, eye contact. Another one as an example is in my own American background, doing this for somebody to come to you is considered cute, friendly, even sexy. The moment I landed in Korea 15 years ago, I found out that this is highly offensive. And it's the way you call a dog or a very young child, somebody at the lowest position in the society. So body language can be wildly different and present a challenge because we'll just unconsciously assume we know what it means. Is, does this mean good? Does it mean something else, for example? And lack of knowledge about the other culture, of course, is a basic challenge. So the cycle of challenges looks like this. We start at the top in the red. We have unexamined assumptions about the other culture. We don't even know we have them, but we have certain assumptions, certain things we think we know, certain beliefs. That comes to or brings to us a lower cohesiveness. We feel less in common with them based on those assumptions. We feel less connected to them. Now, some of those assumptions may be of similarity, but a lot of times it's about things that we find are different from our own culture. That's just naturally where the human brain goes. And so that lowers the um, cohesiveness between us, which then in turn creates communication problems and can also lead to stereotyping. All Chinese are this, all Brazilians think like that which increases mistrust and tension 
and then adds to our unexamined assumptions, our unconscious assumptions. So this is the cycle of challenges when it comes to cross-cultural understanding. So how can we do this? Finally, we get to the actual competency. Number one is missing from this screen, doesn't matter, it's complete ignorance. That's where we all start. And then we reach an aha moment, we reach an awareness of other cultures or that we would like to know about other cultures, that we would like to learn more about them. And that's the second level of conscious incompetence. Now we're aware of how little we know. And we want to go from there to conscious competence, of course, which is learning as well as changing, becoming more open, more flexible and such. And finally, that this is often not quite achieved because this is really mastery where other cultures are second nature to us. That's an unconscious competence. You have a competence you don't have to even think about anymore. So that's the cycle we would like to go through to achieve competence. Some starting points, your willingness. Learn a few words and phrases in another language. How many of you speak one language? Well, if you come from Europe, you probably speak four or five. Those are, that's for a geographic reason, but it's a clear advantage. Most of us speak one or two. So learn at least some level of other languages. Learn generally about other cultures. So a willingness, asking experts, what are the common traps, the common problems, the common challenges between my culture and that culture in particular? What are likely misconceptions and misunderstandings? Next, to check your understanding and that of the other person. Don't just assume everybody understands, but check, ask. And even if it's not typical in that situation, ask anyway, be sure of understanding. Apologize as needed, laugh at yourself. I have learned to laugh at myself much more in 15 years of living abroad and moving about the world than ever before. In fact, most of the time I find the situation and myself in it pretty funny. It's not a bad way to live, really. And it helps with the situation. Local television, I hate television. I've never had a TV in my adult life, very little as a child. But that's neither here nor there. When I go to each new country, I turn on the television, not in my language, in theirs. I don't understand usually much of what's being said. I'm not watching a program. I'm usually flipping through the channels because what I see tells me a lot about how the behavior is in that culture. You can learn a lot by observing TV shows without the language. And finally, reflecting on your own experience. So these are just starting points. We're, we're going on from here. But reflection. Always think about your interaction with people from other cultures. Think about it again and then think about it again and ask more questions and think about it again. And maybe even write about it in a journal and so on or a blog. So here are 10 strategies for cross-cultural communication, which we can often apply to other cross-cultural interactions. We're going to start at the top, ask questions, because that's what I was just mentioning previously. And then we're going to go to the left, actually. Think twice, reflect. I was just saying that. Be flexible, be honest. I made a mistake, I don't understand what you're talking about. I misinterpreted that. I'm sorry that I did something that's socially taboo in your country. Listen actively. How many times do we really listen with every fiber of our being, with all of our attention? Well, in this day and age, with small attention spans and very short interaction through videos and text messages and social media and the like, we're losing a lot of listening skills. So listening very actively helps a lot. It's another way of observing with ears instead of eyes. Ears and eyes should be wide open when you're in any other cultural context than your own. Respecting differences and avoiding stereotyping mentioned. Recognizing the complexity. This is never easy and always worth it, I like to say. It's a lifelong process. And the more you learn and the more comfortable you become with people of other cultures, the more you'll realize how this complexity is also a richness. Building your own self-awareness. Know your own culture, know your own shortcomings, as well as your own skills when it comes to understanding cross-culturally. And distinguish perspectives. Try to pay attention to what is your own viewpoint, what is another culture's viewpoint, and when you are seeing 
their cultural habits through your cultural eyes and try to avoid that. So your toolkit looks like this. Cute. So first of all, prepare, do your homework, do a lot of research, find out what you need to know. Keep reading, read the world news, keep at it. Observe, I mentioned eyes, ears, and the, through the pores of your skin, soak it all up. Take in as much detail as you can. You won't always understand it. A lot of times you won't, but take it in. Compare. I find myself now in the middle of Thailand saying, ah, that thing he just did on my subway is like what they do in Brazil. Or I'm in the middle of Korea and I say, oh, that reminds me of something that's done in the southern states of the US and so on. Now I'm trying very hard not to make that assumption. But lots of things remind me of other cultures and connecting the dots in what ways they're similar and different helps with our broad understanding of the world. Reflecting again, think, think, and then think again about what you're seeing, what is possible interpretations can be, and so on. Inquire. So not until we get fifth from the left do we actually talk about asking other people to do all your own work. And these, of course, are also overlapping skills. Respect goes a long way. Not every single habit or value at the same level, but respect. Let me give you another example there. Korea is extremely hierarchical. I come from a very egalitarian society, not 100%, but very much so comparatively. And I have a hard time with hierarchy. And the Korean language reflects how much respect each person owes the other. So the hierarchy is embedded in the language, which I also then have some difficulty with uh, in using it. But that's me. And I have to recognize that that's me and my own cultural background. And it is my value, but I can't see the other as wrong, just as different. So respect includes differences. Empathy, again, look through the other culture's eyes to the degree, ever increasing degree that you can. And take risk. The risk is usually that you will make mistakes and you will be wrong and you will be laughed at and you will look like a fool and so what. This is what the cultural competency model is often shown to be. And around the base of this is a series of greater and greater steps, starting with the one right at the bottom of the screen that says attitudes. So when your attitude shifts and you begin valuing other cultures equal to your own, and you want to know more about them and engage with people who are from different cultural backgrounds, that leads you then to increasing your intercultural knowledge and skills which then around the circle leads you to your internal outcome, which is an intercultural reflection, thinking about what you're learning and increasing your own understanding and your own empathy. And then an external outcome, which is actually interacting well with people cross-culturally, which leads you to expanding your attitudes again and more knowledge and skills. So that's one cycle. But the greater and greater your skills, the more you spiral upward in this model as well. Looks like this in a chart. The first level at the very top there is actually the bottom of competency and that's cultural destructiveness. That's deliberately denying or rejecting or even outlawing other cultures. That's uh, often called cultural genocide at the extreme where one culture tries to obliterate another not even necessarily the people, but their habits, their language and such. And so that's an intentional level. Most of us have never been at that level. The next one though of cultural incapacity is where we all start. That we know that other cultures exist, but we don't have any capability. And then cultural blindness is next, where we really assume more that we're more alike than different because after all, we're all human. But that's a mental shortcut. That's a non-thinking approach. Sure, we're alike in some ways, basic human values, but we're different in many ways. So that's a cultural blindness. And then cultural sensitivity, we're willing to learn. We reach a level of sensitivity and interest. And then competency, we've gained some skills. And then finally, proficiency. That's the ultimate where you're highly skilled in this area. Also looks like this, 
this is my favorite of the charts actually. So the, there are six stages here, the same as before. Not quite the same stages though, but the first three are ethnocentric, which means coming from our own cultural viewpoint, looking at others through our cultural eyes. And the last three are ethno-relative stages, which are looking at other cultures through their own cultural eyes. So that's where we want to aim for. The first denial, no reason to know about other cultures, staying completely in your own same, same culture comfort zone. Second one, defense. My culture is superior, why should I bother? Those poor fill in the blank for any other culture. Minimization, we're all the same. Differences are superficial. Again, that's really kind of denial and a mental shortcut. And really all the same usually means they're all like me. So it's still ethnocentric. But then we shift into, and that's going from thinking toward feeling affective. And we go into the second affective phase, but we're shifting into ethno-relative in the second half of this. And that's acceptance. There are differences. They're not a problem or a challenge so much as something of interest to me. And then adaptation. I am becoming competent. I can use different standards to evaluate different cultural con uh, contexts, not just my own culture of origin as the standard. And finally, integration. I feel just about as comfortable in other cultures as I do in my own. Ultimate goal. Finally, finally, our last chart. This is four broad areas of cultural competence, knowledge, sensitivity, actual competence, awareness leading to more knowledge, more sensitivity, more competence leading to more awareness, more knowledge, more sensitivity, more competence you can see. This as an ongoing pattern, a lifelong pattern. And in the center of this is compassion, by which I would also say empathy. We are not all the same, but we are all human at the end of the day. So in this vast, colorful, complex, rich and wonderful world of ours, both the world at large and our BPW world, I think that intercultural competency is not only fascinating, but well worth the effort that it takes. Thank you so much for listening.